grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Spirit of love, you know our frailties and weaknesses, not from a distance, but up close and personal through your Son. When we turn to you in faith for help, even with a weak faith, hear us from heaven and grant us deliverance. In Jesus' precious and powerful name, amen. In our gospel lesson, many miracles of Jesus are recorded throughout the gospels. Stories where Jesus day by day brings healing and relief to people in pain or who are sick or dying. But today, Jesus does it simply by speaking the words. The sick girl wasn't even there. And yet, from a distance, Christ was able to heal her. And then in a second story, we have a healing of intimacy where Jesus is presented with a man who had been deaf from birth, and by touching him, Jesus granted him hearing and speech. Now first of all, let's take a look at this young girl and a rather audacious mother. This woman approaches Jesus and asks for help. Now, to set the scene for you, remember we've had the stories of Jesus feeding thousands and then being overwhelmed by the crowds who want to make him their king and then trying to get away, but the crowds keep finding him. So this time, he just leaves the area completely and he travels up the coastline to the city of Tyre and Sidon, totally out of Palestine. And there he goes into someone's home with the hope that he can maintain his anonymous stature and be able to rest with him. But this woman learns that Jesus is there. And she approaches Jesus. I don't know about you. This lady's got a lot of nerve. But she had no business approaching Jesus. First of all, she was a Gentile. She was not one of the family of Jewish people. And she had no reason to approach him. Secondly, she was female. And she would never have been permitted to speak to a man, either in her culture or in the culture of the Hebrews. And yet, here she comes. And first of all, she acknowledges Jesus for who he is when she calls him son of David. So apparently she had some familiarity with the scripture because she knew the prophecies that God would send the Messiah from the lineage of David. She calls him Lord, and in so doing, acknowledges him as master and king. And then in verses 22 and 25, utters a very simple prayer. And I suspect it's one that we have all, at one time or another, also offered to God. Have mercy on me. Help me. Now, expressions like that are irresistible to God. Her persistence in this encounter reveals not just her determination, but also her growing faith. I have no doubt that Jesus was pleased by her love for her daughter and the extent to which she was willing to go to bring healing to her. She was persistent. She was obstinate. She would not give up. Now let's look at how this incident is recorded. 
Jesus says to her something that sounds rather cruel at first. You have no business asking for this from me. For I'm not here for you. I'm here to feed the children of Israel. And it's not right to take their food and give it to the dogs. And her reply, yeah, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Now it sounds almost like Jesus is insulting her. And it's important to observe that in the Greek passage, the word that we translate as dog does not mean wild dog like the ones that roam the street, but rather house pet, a member of the family. I don't know how many of you, how many have dogs in your home? Oh, a lot of you, okay. Let's face it, our pets are members of our family. We had the most remarkable conversation with our grandchildren from Illinois the last time we were with them. They were describing their pets. They have a cat, female. They have two little rodents. I don't know what kind of rodent they are, gerbil, hamster, whatever. Also female. And they had two fish, one male, one female. The male fish died. <laughs> and the way they tell it, he committed suicide. <laughs> because he didn't want to be the only male in the house. <laughs> we grieve when our pets die. I have the ashes of our dog Mocha in my home and a little piece of clay with her paw print on it because she was a member of the family. And so Jesus is saying to her, I hear your request, but you don't fit in the pecking order. It's not right to take table food and give it to the house pets. Well, I don't know about you, but I seem to recall a number of meals that my dog got when I was a kid simply because I didn't want to eat it. <laughs> and so when mom's not looking, little <laughs> hand over the side of the table. <coughs> How many of you feed your pets table scraps? Very few, okay. Well, you wouldn't feed them before you eat, would you? No, you take what's left over and give it to the dogs. And so that's what Jesus is saying. You're only worthy of the, of the, the leftovers. I'm not here for you. I'm here for the Israelites. And her response was, well, I'm not here for a meal. I just want a scrap. I just want a crumb. Anything you give me would be a blessing. And Jesus is so impressed by her faith and her belief in him that even though he had no business doing so, because she was ew, a woman, and ew, not a Jew, he comments on her faith and says, let it be done. Your daughter is healed. I love that in the text. Your daughter is healed. Not is gonna be, not will recover, not will get better. Your daughter is healed. The demons are God. And so of course, what would you do? I picture this woman running home. She's approached Jesus. Jesus has given her the best possible news she could have. He didn't offer to go with her. He healed the girl right from where he was. And I know she ran home to check it out and see if it was true. In her faith, she knew it was. And she gets home and there's the girl sitting on the side of the bed, just as happy as could be. Probably just sitting there playing a video game. <laughs> and then our second mirror, something a little more intimate. 
Jesus comes back down the coast towards his home territory, and they bring to him a man whose ears are stopped up and who can't hear. Now, I got into a big hoo-ha with one of my classes earlier this week. I don't know what it is about the phones, but today's teenagers are addicted to them. They can't put them down. It doesn't matter where they are. They could even be in church, and they would have their phones out, watching videos or playing games. And here were these students listening to music in class, and the one boy goes, well, it's in my IEP that I can listen to music, so there. Okay, IEP stands for Individualized Education Program. And it's a program that we set up for special education students to compensate for their learning disability. And we put what are called accommodations into the lesson plan so that we can ameliorate whatever the disability happens to be. If you don't remember what you hear, I can provide you a copy of the notes. If you don't remember what you read, I can explain the notes to you and so on. But for some students who have a difficulty focusing, they are permitted to wear or use a device that blots out the external noise so they can focus. They think that gives them permission to listen to music. And I explained to them, no, that's not how it works. Because I know how it is for me. When I'm home and I'm working on lesson plans or working on the service or the sermon for Sunday, if I've got choral music playing, and it doesn't matter if it's the Beatles or Beethoven, I'm singing along. And I can see those kids in the classroom. They're supposed to be writing the paragraph, and they're <laughs> <laughs> listening to 45 Cent or something like that. Yeah, I know it's 50 Cent, but he's on discount this week. <laughs> but if I want to focus, I listen to instrumental music. And that's just playing in the background, and I can concentrate. So I told him, if you want to listen to some classical music, I'll play that for you. Let's just say he expressed disdain for that. And so I pointed out to him that according to the law, what I am required to do for someone in your situation is provide you with a noise blanking device. If you are a shooter, the muffs that you wear at the shooting range, are designed to cancel out the noise. If you've got fancy headsets, you can put them on, flip the switch, and it immediately cancels out all the external noise. You hear nothing. And so I told our young man, I would be happy to provide some noise canceling devices for you. They're little small sponge cylinders, <laughs> about half an inch high. And you roll them between thumb and forefinger until they're a little spear, and then you insert them into the ear, release, and watch them go, and they fill the ear canal. I was stunned when he wasn't interested in that. Can't imagine why. There are times when I would like absolute silence. In fact, I was listening to Music on the way up here, radio station called The Spa, playing this brainless music that just kind of and it allows me to just focus and drive. But then I pull up, I turn the engine off, turn the radio off, and I just sit. Blessed silence. That's nice for about five minutes. I don't know how thrilled that would be after five hours. 
or five days. I'm not sure how thrilled I would be if I had to go through my entire life not being able to hear, not knowing what music was, not knowing the sound of my wife's voice, or hearing the laughter of my grandchildren. This man is brought to Jesus, and he's never been able to hear. Furthermore, he can't speak, which kind of makes sense because you learn to speak from what you hear. I wish I would have been born being able to speak French, Italian, and Spanish, but nobody in my home did. You learn what you hear your parents say. That's how we learn language. This man didn't have a language. And so he comes to Jesus. And they pray for him to be healed. Now I'm sure most of you remember the blackout of 2003, where most of the northeastern United States and parts of Canada were without power. From Cleveland to New York City and north into Canada. No electricity whatsoever. No lights, no air conditioning, nothing. And I read about a man who had been sightseeing that day and was in the Empire State Building got into an elevator to ride up to the observation deck, and when he got in, he was the only passenger. And I'll bet he thought to himself, oh, lucky, lucky me. I'm not all crammed in there like a sardine. And then the power went out. For five hours, he was trapped in that elevator car. Nobody would hear him. Nobody would see him. He was in absolute darkness with no possibility of escape. Can you imagine the relief he felt when after five hours, a New York City firefighter had come down the cable from above, opened the door in the roof of the elevator and was able to pull him out. That's our story for this morning. This man was not able to hear. Can you imagine what went through his mind as he's brought before Jesus? I find myself wondering, did he even know who Jesus was? I don't see how he could know. Because nobody could have told him. Unless he himself was a witness to something Jesus had done. And Jesus reaches out and puts his fingers in the man's ear, spits, and touches the man's tongue. Immediately, he could hear the sound of voices, the chirping of the birds. I'll bet you it sounds loud to him, for someone who'd never been able to hear anything before. I was talking to my mother the other day. I told her I was going to tell you this story. <laughs> She's 90, and it's time to adjust the hearing aids again. I can always tell when her hearing aids are off. Because when I talk to her, she'll say, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that tells me she has no idea what I just said. Ma, are your hearing aids in? What? <laughs> Put your hearing aids in. Turn them on. Hit the button that enables you to talk on the phone. That's what she needs to do. And we all reach a point where the years begin to add up and our body can't do now what it used to do before. We all reach a point in our lives where different sources of stress 
not just the physical ones, begin to add up. And along comes Jesus, who knows our pain, who knows our situation, and who comes to bring healing. Now, if you're without a job, Jesus is not a recruiter. Hmm. He's not going to find you a job. And Jesus can come and touch my life, but I'm still 67 years old. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow 47. Sorry, sweetheart. <laughs> what are you doing with a 47-year-old guy anyhow? <laughs> no. God comes to us to heal us from within. There's a wonderful story about a memorial to the Second World War that is written in the book Girded with Truth and talks about an amputee veteran who comes up to this shrine bringing flowers to lay before the memorial. And someone mocks him and says, what do you think God's going to do? Is he going to give you your leg back? And the soldier paused for a moment and said, no. He's going to teach me how to live without it. God comes to heal us from within. And as the crowds said 2,000 years ago, so we can say today, look at that. He does everything well. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Before we do our offering,